Okay, the last lectures we have looked at the quadratic family, uh, which looks like this. And we looked a bit at the uh, periodic orbits that you have, especially the fixed points and the period two points. And we want to see uh, if they are stable or unstable and how they emerge and so on. And we had this diagram. Uh, let me use the blue for this is the x direction and this is the parameter direction. Uh, going from zero up to four, but let's do the scaling a bit different because most of the interesting things happen between three and four. And then we had a fixed point that was stable until uh, the parameter value one. And then it continued, but was unstable. So I dotted all the way through up to four. And at one, we had a different fixed point that kind of moved off like this. And then something happened at uh, the value, the parameter value three. Well, it continued being unstable, but then something new sprang off. Okay, so this was fixed point. This was another fixed point. But this is period two. And that uh, went on until a particular value, which was two plus the square root of six. Uh, no, that should be one plus the square root of six, of six. And then something else happened here, namely those that period two orbit became a period three orbit. Well, it continues unstable, but the stable part is now period four. And in fact, it continues like this. What we also saw is at some parameter is more in this direction, where it's three is parameter more or less 3.8 where a period three thing emerges out of the blue. And that, that one doubles and so on. So what we want to do today is describe in detail what happens when something happens to this six points, these period two points and so on. And these things are called bifurcations. Uh, so here is a bifurcation taking place. Uh, so is here. And of course here, also a bifurcation. And also where this period three appears for the first time. Again, we speak about bifurcations. And they have particular names uh, because these are the three types that actually occur. This is called a transcritical. This is a period doubling. For obvious reason, because the fixed period, uh, point, what is period one, turned into period two, and then it turns into period four and so on. And this thing, where something new appears out of the blue, that is called a saddle node bifurcation. So this uh, is a bit as a motivation what we're going to do in this lecture. So what I really want to do in this lecture is today as a recap what it means to be hyperbolic, uh, secondly, I want to describe and define 
what actually is a bifurcation. And third, uh, is a result that there are no bifurcations to hyperbolic periodic orbits. So if you want to see a, hyper, uh, a bifurcation, you must first make sure that your periodic point is no longer hyperbolic. So the multiplier is no longer supposed to be uh, away from the unit circle. And then I'm going to list types of bifurcation. And there are uh, zillions of types of bifurcations, but in this lecture I will only discuss uh, four types, no, namely those three that I already mentioned, the saddle node, something that I didn't mention yet, but that's called a pitchfork. Uh, or also called fold. And the last one that I want to do today is that one over there. That's the period of it. And all of these I want to do for discrete and continuous time. That is to say, maps and flows. So that is basically what I want to do today. And so let's start with what it means for a point to be hyperbolic. Okay, for that I first need to erase the board. So I'm going to do uh, a difference between discrete and continuous time. So here we have a map. F, let's say it goes from R to R. And here we have an ODE, uh, which looks like this. And we have a periodic point let's call it x0 and let's say the period is p and here we have a stationary point uh, and that means that f in this particular point is 0 and uh, here we can also uh, say what the multiplier is. That is to say, we take this iterate and we take the derivative and we compute it at this periodic point and we call it lambda. That is the multiplier. And here we do not really have uh, something called the multiplier, but we can still look at this. And let's call it lambda anyway. Okay. Now, then we say that x0 is hyperbolic if lambda in absolute value is not 1. And here, this stationary point is called hyperbolic. if the real part of lambda is not equal to zero. Okay. And we know that if uh, lambda is 
less than one in absolute value, then this periodic point is stable. If it's equal to one, then it's neutral. If it's bigger than one, then it's unstable. Whereas in this case, uh, the real part of lambda can be less than zero, then it's stable. Equal to zero, then it's neutral. And bigger than zero, then it's unstable. So the outer ones is hyperbolic, and that is not hyperbolic. <clears throat> so the question what do we want to answer how do periodic points and also stationary points emerge or disappear or change stability if you change the map and that uh, <clears throat> this this types of change emerging or disappearing periodic orbits uh, changing of stability, that is what is called a bifurcation. And I will write down the, uh, uh, the uh, exact definition in a second. Okay, the definition is as follows. So, um, uh, now we're going to put a parameter to my uh, map. Let's do it for the map. Uh, and the parameter is epsilon. And we say that this family, one parameter family, undergoes a bifurcation if the qualitative nature of some feature, in this case, a periodic point, changes. That is to say, if, for example, the multiplier changes from 2 to 3, uh, that is not a qualitative change because lambda is 2 is unstable and lambda 3 is still unstable. But if it changes from 2 to a half, then somewhere it went to 1. And that is where the bifurcation really changes or really takes place because we just go from unstable to stable behavior. And uh, I want to do a little uh, theorem about when a bifurcation can take place. And as an aside for this, I need to recall the implicit function theorem. And the version that I want to have is let f go from rm cross rn into rm be a ck map. So I have k uh, derivatives, all of them continuous. And also assume that at some point this function has the value 0. And the third one is that if I take the partial derivative with respect to the first variable, 
of this. Oops, that is a bit too much. Too many Fs. Evaluated at the same point x0, epsilon 0. And if this is uh, invertible, then <clears throat> uh, there is a CK function which I want to denote by x going from a neighborhood of epsilon 0 to r such that, well, in epsilon 0 is simply x0 and f, when I plug in this function of epsilon into f, then this is always zero for every epsilon in this neighborhood u. Okay. And from this we get the following fact that, uh, let's call this a proposition, a, a hyperbolic periodic point cannot uh, let's say immediately disappear and the proof of this is, well, we need to find the correct capital F to apply the implicit function theorem. Uh, so what we are going to do, we look at Fp of x0 minus x0. Well, x0 is a periodic point, so this is going to be 0. But this is what I call, oh, there was an epsilon here. Uh, this is what I call F of x0, epsilon 0, and we know this is 0. Okay, that is that this thing is already satisfied. Then I need to look at the partial derivative of this function, this here, applied to the same values, x0, epsilon 0. Okay, that is to say I need to look at the derivative of x, fp epsilon 0 at x0 minus the derivative of x0 with respect to x. So that's simply 1. And we know that this is the multiplier minus 1. And therefore it's not 0 because uh, I use hyperbolicity here. Lambda is not on the unit circle in particular. It's not 1. So by the implicit function theorem, there exists a neighborhood u of this, of epsilon 0, and there exists a function for epsilon in u, such that, well, this here is always going to be 0, x, epsilon, epsilon. And this is fp epsilon, not epsilon zero, but then this uh, more very uh, more general epsilon, this epsilon in this neighborhood u, uh, applied to x epsilon minus x epsilon is zero, and that means It is still periodic, and that is precisely what we want. It does not disappear. Uh, to understand these bifurcations, by 
fabrications, we use something called a normal form. By which we means which we mean uh, kind of a simplest standard formula, uh, which exhibit the particular bifurcation that we want to study. That is to say, we have our function, and um, by a change of coordinates. And in general, we do not have to find this change of coordinates explicitly. We can bring it into a simple form. And as an example, let's do the first bifurcation to look at. That is the transcritical bifurcation. And there, the normal form is this. So we have this map. And only what we need to do is use this formula. Minus x squared. Okay. Can we compute the fixed points here? Uh, yes. Fixed points. X is zero. For fixed points, we need to say that this is equal to X, right? Uh, and if we divide out x, then it's 1 plus epsilon minus x is 1. So that is the other fixed point is x is epsilon. Yeah. Okay, let's, let's draw that. What happens if um, if epsilon is less than 0? Then let's draw some axes right here and the diagonal. So here is x and here is f of x. And the graph then looks like, oops, try to do this cleverly. The graph looks like this. So here's a fixed point, and there is a fixed point. Okay, this fixed point is indeed at epsilon, which is negative, so that fits. <clears throat> and the multiplier at, uh, at zero is less than one because it's one plus epsilon, epsilon negative. So this is stable. Okay, what happens if epsilon is zero? Again, the axis, the diagonal. And if epsilon is zero, we're looking at the function x minus x squared. And that is exactly tangent to the diagonal at zero. So here we had two fixed points. Here is one fixed point, or if you like, two fixed points merged into one. And then, of course, we also want to do to see what happens if epsilon is bigger than zero. Okay, again the axis. And now the graph looks like this. So now there are two fixed points again. Zero and this one, which is its epsilon. And now we see that that one is uh, unstable because its multiplier is now larger than one. And here it's neutral. because lambda is exactly one. 
Another way of depicting this, and I hope I have space for this, is the following. Let's do it like this. Here I have X, and here I have Epsilon. And I'm going to draw the stable fixed points in red. Okay, for Epsilon negative, zero is stable. And at a certain point, you read where epsilon is equal to zero. And then the stable one is here. So it goes up like epsilon. So the stable one goes like this. And if I dot the unstable one, it comes from below here. That is this one. That is that point. At zero, they merge into a single one. And then... it continues unstable like that point zero. So what happens here is that I have two fixed points. As epsilon change, they get closer. They merge precisely at the bifurcation point, and then they swap their stability. The zero was stable becomes unstable. The other one was unstable becomes stable. And this is what is called a transcritical bifurcation. And that's the first one that I mentioned. And that this is the one that happens in the quadratic family when the parameter A is 1. Okay, so we go to the next bifurcation. Okay, the next bifurcation is called the saddle node bifurcation. And now we have the normal form uh, f x is equal to x plus x minus x squared. And now that I write down normal forms, maybe it's good just in a corner to record what normal forms we used so far. So we had the transcritical. That was f epsilon of x is 1 plus epsilon x minus x squared. And now we have saddle note. Is epsilon minus f plus x minus x squared. And now let's see what this becomes. Okay, so we start with epsilon uh, less than zero, and I draw the axis again. So here is f of x, and here is x, and the diagonal. And... Uh, well, this is what it looks like. If epsilon is negative, uh, then, and here we have the uh, slope is one here. So it's gonna look like this. And that means no fixed point. Because if we start say here, and then look what happens. Then we get this spider web diagram. And we just go through this funnel and there is no fixed point. We just move to the left and never converge to anything. So conclusion, no fixed point. Okay, then at epsilon is equal to zero. Again, the axis. And diagonal. And now the graph is exactly tangent to the diagonal. 
And that means that here's a fixed point. Oh, actually, maybe it would be good to compute the fixed points in the first place, but here's a fixed point uh, which is uh, neutral. Lambda is exactly one, so this is one fixed point. Oh, shall we just compute the fixed points? If this is x, that means that uh, x is plus or minus the square root of epsilon. Because the x disappears, bring the x squared to the other side, and you get epsilon is x squared. So x is plus or minus square root of epsilon. And then it's also clear that you would not have a fixed point here if epsilon is negative, because we're not going to take the square root out of a negative number. And if epsilon is zero, then this plus or minus gives the same result zero. So we have indeed one fixed point. So it becomes interesting if epsilon is positive. Um, then the axis here. Diagonal. And now we find indeed two fixed points, two fixed points. And this one is stable. You can see that the slope here is less than one. And this one is unstable. Slope is more than one, not plus more than one. Okay, we can also do that in this other way of uh, depicting it. So here is uh, x and here is epsilon. Something at zero, there happens something. Well, how is it? I will try to do the stable ones in red and the unstable ones in blue. Uh, well, here nothing happens because there is no fixed point, but here it emerges, and it emerges like this. This is the stable one, and symmetric on the other side, here is the unstable one. Now let's do some extra thing. Let's see in which direction the movement is. So here in this blue, I sh showed you that uh, if you have x, f of x, is further to the left, so the movement is to the left, and this picture is downward. <coughs> and uh, the same happens here, if you are above this, it's still downward. And if you're below the green line, it's still downwards. And then we see that this point here, zero, is attracting from the right and repelling from the left. Now, between these curves, the arrows change, and you get this picture. And then you see that from the blue uh, line, indeed, the movement is away. So this is unstable, and in the red line, the movement is towards it, so that is stable. So that is the second bifurcation. So we're going to the next one, which is called the pitchfork. Next bifurcation is the pitchfork. And in this case, the normal form looks like this. So let's write it here as well. And we can try to compute the fixed points. Well, in this case, zero is always a fixed point. Or, well, take divide the x away and cancel the x, which was then a one, you get minus epsilon plus x squared is zero. 
So that means x is plus or minus square root of epsilon. Okay, we're going to do the three pictures again. Epsilon less than zero, axis, x, f of x, diagonal. Okay, so uh, when x is zero, it goes to zero, and the slope there is one minus epsilon. Epsilon is negative. So 1 minus epsilon is bigger than 1. And that means it looks like this. And when x is positive, it only goes faster. So it looks like this. And here, lambda is bigger than 1. So I have one fixed point. And it is unstable. Okay, epsilon is equal to zero. At this moment, the slope at the fixed point zero is exactly one. So this is neutral. And the graph looks like this. Uh, but you can still see that if I take a point close by and look at the spider diagram, it moves away. So it's still unstable, but not hyperbolic. It's only neutrally unstable. Okay, so what happens if epsilon is positive? Uh, axis in green. Diagonal. And now, lambda is going to be less than 1. Because the slope is 1 minus epsilon. Now epsilon is positive, so it looks like this. But the way it curves upwards and curves downwards. So now, where we had one fixed point here. We have now three fixed points. And this one in the middle is stable. And this one, and this one, well here, they are both unstable. Okay. So let's do the other diagram as well. Here is the, param uh, the x, and here is the parameter. Something happens at zero. And what do I have? For epsilon negative, I have an unstable fixed point at zero. So this is what I'm going to dot. And then at zero, it becomes stable. And at, at zero, I also find two new fixed points that move away from the, or the horizontal axis like plus or minus square root of epsilon, so this is like this. And this shape explains why we call this a pitchfork bifurcation. Okay, let's also do the, the, the arrows in which direction we go. Uh, well, for negative epsilon, we move away from the origin, so the arrows go this way. And that way. And the same is still true at epsilon is zero. So it's indeed unstable. And I can continue with these arrows over here. But between these curves, something changes, namely the direction of the arrows. And the thing in the middle becomes stable, and the two outer curves are unstable. And that is more or less what is said about the pitchfork bifurcation, except I have two remarks to make. 
uh, remarks. There is another normal form. If I do this one, and now instead of the plus x squared, we do minus x squared, is also pitchfork. <clears throat> uh, but the stable, unstable nature swaps. So you can check that yourself. And uh, yeah, whereas these other bifurcations that I had, the transcritical and the saddle node, indeed appear in the quadratic family, there is no pitchfork. in the quadratic family. And that remark makes a nice exercise. Okay, so we go to the last bifurcation, which is called the period domain. Now we get to the period doubling <coughs> bifurcation. And in this case, the normal form is like this. <coughs> uh, epsilon minus one, x minus x squared. So let's write it here as well. No, it was minus. <clears throat> and if we want to find the fixed points, well, uh, uh, at least x is zero is a good point. And if we divide it away, uh, <clears throat> then we get, well, or uh, epsilon minus two x minus x squared. No, that's not okay. Okay, there is apparently another fixed point, but it is far away from x is zero. Even if epsilon is zero, it's still far away. So I'm not really interested in that one, but let's see what happens. Well, I have this d uh, axis again. Epsilon less than zero uh, axis. Diagonal. <clears throat> and the graph looks like this. Um, so we see one fixed point. And uh, if we look at the slope at the point zero, Lambda is epsilon minus one for uh, negative epsilon. This is uh, So the fourth 
Uh, bifurcation is the period doubling bifurcation, and I already took a bit of a head start. Uh, so the normal form is uh, this one, and now I've got a minus there, so it's basically minus 1 plus epsilon times x, minus x squared, and if I compute the fixed points, then I get x is 0, divide out x is 0, and the other fixed point is there, uh, close to minus 2, and that's so far away from 0 that I'm not really interested in that one. But this is the period doubling bifurcation, and I put it there as well. And again, I have the three cases where epsilon is less than zero. Uh, if epsilon is less than zero, that means that the slope is minus one plus epsilon, epsilon less than zero. So this is a number slightly bigger than minus one. And that means that this is less than one, the multiplier, and therefore this is stable. And there's one fixed point. And the other fixed point is far away, so I'm not interested. Now, if epsilon is zero, and then I again have this fixed point over here, and now the slope is exactly minus one, so this is a neutral fixed point. One fixed point, neutral. And yeah, what happens if epsilon is bigger than zero? So now the slope is going to be minus one minus epsilon, epsilon positive, so the slope is going to be less than minus one, and that means unstable. So in this case, we only managed to make uh, a stable fixed point unstable, but there is more, and that more appears if we look at the second iterate. Look at second iterate. So now we're going to look at this, but the second iterate. And that is a bit of a computation, but here it goes. Uh, so this is f of epsilon x minus 1 plus epsilon x minus x squared. And that looks like this. Minus 1 plus epsilon times this thing. Minus the square of the argument. And if you work this out, you get 1 plus epsilon squared x plus 1 plus epsilon uh, x squared Still something wrong And now work out the square here, we get minus 1 plus epsilon squared x squared minus 2 times 1 plus epsilon x cubed minus x to the fourth. Now, we think of epsilon being very small. And that means that morally, this 1 plus epsilon 
and 1 plus epsilon squared is both very close to 1, it's almost the same. And therefore we're going to cancel it. Almost the same. Okay, so if I write it again, I get 1 plus 2 epsilon minus epsilon squared times x minus 2 1 plus epsilon x cubed. And that is minus x to the fourth. And that is almost the alternative version uh, of the pitchfork bifurcation. That is to say, if you take the second iterate of this one, we get something that looks much more like a pitchfork. And that's what I'm going to draw now. So again, epsilon less than zero. And then it looks like this. Uh, it's stable. It's like this. I know all the fixed points nearby. Uh, epsilon equal to zero. It's about the same graph, but now this is a tangent line. So there is lambda prime for the second iterate is one, whereas here lambda prime was less than one. Okay, just to make sure that we're looking at the correct thing. This is what we're looking at, at the second iterate. Same here. And then here we have just the same picture. I hope I have enough space. Diagonal. Uh, so this was stable. This was neutral. So I think I will now see something which is unstable. And the graph looks like this. And now we see two fixed points appearing. But this is fixed point for the second iterate. And if it's for the second iterate and there's no fixed point for the first iterate, that means that apparently what is appearing here, the same spot, okay, can't really draw it. All right, let's make this a bit bigger. And here, there's going to be an orbit of period two. So uh, there's one fixed point, but orbit of period two emerges. And that is exactly what the name period doubling bifurcation is expressing. Okay, after having done these bifurcations for maps, I'm going to do the same bifurcations, in fact, for uh, continuous di time dynamical systems. So this is going to be bifurcations. for ODEs and that means that instead of fixed points or periodic points we are going to look for stationary points uh, and the normal forms remain the same 
except I want to subtract x. And now it's good that I had this normal form still here. So uh, for uh, continuous time, the normal forms will look like this. I take away an x, I take away an x, I take away an x, and I take away an x. Well, uh, this is not taking away an x. Uh, I, I'm going to do it more rigorous. I just take away the whole bifurcation. Because a period doubling bifurcation for ODEs makes no sense. Okay, so let's uh, try to do this transcritical with this new normal form. So, okay, the normal form is in this case, so we do the transcritical. And the normal form is of epsilon x equals uh, epsilon x minus x squared. And instead of putting this equal to x to find a fixed point, now we want to find a stationary point. Uh, and solving this equation gives, well, x is 0. Or x is epsilon. It's exactly the same as before because now we're not looking at x here but zero, but we has all we have also subtracting an x from the normal form. Okay. So now oops, we have epsilon less than zero. Uh, we draw the following picture. Here is this fixed point. And what happens if x is positive? Uh, well, x squared is much smaller than x. So epsilon x minus x squared is very close to zero, still going to be positive. And that means, oh, I see I make a mistake. Uh, it's positive. No, it's negative. Ah, epsilon is negative. So this is going to be negative value, and that means I'm going to walk to the left. Uh, for x negative, this is going to be positive, so I walk here. But there is this other fixed point, this other stationary point, at epsilon. This is at zero. And this is at epsilon. Well, this is going to be stable. And this is unstable. Uh, stable and indeed if you take x less than minus epsilon it becomes negative again and then you get this okay so epsilon is equal to zero in this case it's two um, uh, stationary points merge into one stationary point. Here we had two stationary points. And this one becomes neutral. And we can see that if epsilon is zero, we just have minus x squared. And that means that uh, no matter if we're in the positive or the negative axis, uh, the value is always negative. That means that this point here is attracting from the right and repelling from the left. And uh, that is not what you can have in a hyperbolic stationary point. It has to be neutral. Okay. And then for epsilon positive. Now again, we have two stationary points. Um, the picture looks like this. Uh, at zero is now going to be unstable and at epsilon is going to be stable because what happens if x is very large then f of x is negative so you walk to the left 
if, if x is very negative, we also walk to the left. And in between, we walk to the right. So this one becomes stable. You, march, you, you move towards it. And this one is unstable because you move away from it. And yeah, this is the transcritical bifurcation for um, this particular ODE. Again, we can just do this picture where we do all the uh, epsilon in one graph. And then what happens is that we have zero being stable up to a particular point, namely epsilon is zero. And then it becomes unstable. Whereas the other stationary point starts on the negative axis and is unstable. Then it merges with zero and then it continues, but in a stable fashion. So again, the stability of the two fixed points when they merge is exchanged. And the arrows that you see are like this. And between the curves, they flip. Okay, so two more bifurcations to go. Okay, let's try to do the two remaining bifurcations uh, in a single screen. Sorry, the saddle node bifurcation. And there the normal form, we can read it on the right, is uh, f epsilon of x is epsilon minus x squared. And if we want to put this equal to zero, that gives x is plus or minus the square root of epsilon. Okay, let's do the pictures. Epsilon negative, epsilon equals to zero, and epsilon bigger than zero. Well, uh, if epsilon is negative, there's no fixed point, no stationary point. So no stationary point. Uh, here there is one stationary point, namely x is zero, and here there are two. And that's what you expect in a saddle node. So, pictures look like this. No stationary point, everything goes to the left. Because if epsilon is negative, this is just a negative value. Uh, when epsilon is zero, there is one stationary point. It is attracting from the right and repelling from the left. And that means that this stationary point has to be neutral. And then for epsilon positive, there are now indeed two stationary points. From the far right, you still go to the left. From the far left, you go only further to the left, but in the middle, you go to the right. And that means that this one is stable. And this one is unstable. And if we make the same diagram with all the epsilon inside, then the stationary points, well, they emerge where epsilon is zero. And how do they do that? Well, here it's neutral, but then we get a stable branch going like this and an unstable branch going like this. And then if we draw the arrows, well, when there wasn't the stable, uh, stationary point yet, everything went to the left. So everything goes down. Uh, and you still go down if you're far away from 
zero, but in between the two curves, the arrow flips. So we get this. And that means that indeed the red curve is stable and the blue curve is unstable. And that is the phase diagram, the phase portrait for this one. So let's try to do the remaining one, which was the pitchfork. But in case of continuous time, this is also called a fold bifurcation. And the normal form, it's up there. F epsilon of x is minus epsilon x plus x squared. And if we put this equal to zero, uh, that gives x is zero or uh, x is plus or minus the square root of x. Okay, so we finished with the last two bifurcations for ODEs and I made a head start here. Uh, so on the left I did already the saddle node bifurcation. And that means that the uh, normal form is uh, epsilon minus x squared. And if I put that equal to zero to find the stationary points, then indeed I get x is plus or minus square root of epsilon. And that means that I will only have a stationary point when epsilon is greater or equal to zero. No stationary points at epsilon less than zero. And then indeed the movement is always to the left because epsilon minus x squared is always negative. Now if x, sorry, if epsilon is zero, then I have precisely one stationary point at zero. But if x is not equal to zero, then f of x is negative because it's minus x squared. So all the movement is to the left. And that makes this stationary point neutral because it's attracting from the right and repelling from the left. If epsilon is positive, then two stationary points emerge uh, at plus and minus square root of epsilon. And uh, Looking at the arrows again, we see that from the right, we move to the left. On the far left, we move even further to the left, but in between, we move to the right, and that makes plus square root of epsilon stable, uh, minus square root of epsilon unstable. Uh, indeed, unstable and stable, and if we try to capture that in a single diagram with epsilon on the horizontal x and x on the vertical axis, then we see this stable curve emerging from epsilon is equal to zero, and on the other side, an unstable curve is emerging. And we can draw these arrows again, far to the left, all the arrows point downwards, uh, actually, most of the arrows point downwards, also when epsilon is positive and x is very large and, and very small. But in between those two curves, the arrows reverse the direction, and then we see that this red curve indeed attracts all the, the movement close by, whereas the blue curve uh, repels all the movement nearby, and therefore that's an unstable curve. So that's the saddle node bifurcation, and we finish with the pitchfork bifurcation, which in the continuous time case, so for ODEs, is sometimes also called a fold bifurcation. So in this case, the normal form is f epsilon of x is 1 minus, is minus epsilon x, because the x disappears, plus x cubed, and if we put this equal to zero, then the stationary points will be zero, or plus or minus square root of epsilon. So let's draw the diagrams again <coughs> for epsilon negative, 
epsilon is equal to zero and epsilon positive. And there it looks like this. Okay. Zero is always a stationary point. And if epsilon is negative, that's the only one because uh, square root of minus of epsilon would be a negative square root. So this one is the only stationary point. And if we draw the arrows, uh, it's always going to be negative because, well, is it always going to be negative? Let's see. For x positive, epsilon also negative. This has become positive, so it's going to be this direction. And if x is negative, minus epsilon, something negative as a whole is negative. Dominates this one, which is, by the way, also negative. So we see that this one is unstable. If x is zero, uh, then we still have one stationary point. And now let's look at the arrows. Uh, this term is zero because epsilon is zero. For x positive, this is positive. Maybe not as positive as over here, but still positive. And if x is negative, uh, is negative, so this is still unstable, but in this case, neutrally unstable. And then for epsilon positive, I get two new stationary points. So the old one was at zero, you get one at plus square root of epsilon and one at minus square root of epsilon. And if we now draw the arrows, it's still positive and negative if x is far away from zero. But in between, arrows flip and we get this one. That means that zero now is stable. And the other two are both unstable. And indeed we have now three stationary points. Okay, we finish off with the diagram over here. And uh, epsilon is on the horizontal axis, x is on the vertical one. And now we see that we start off with an unstable stationary point at zero. And when epsilon is equal to zero, this changes into a stable one. And additionally, two unstable station points emerge like this. So we again see this specific pitchfork uh, type of diagram, uh, face portrait. And let's draw the arrows again. In this case, we move away from the origin. And if we far away from the origin, we only move further away. But in between, the arrows change direction. And then we see also because of these arrows that the two dotted lines here are both unstable. And in between, that stationary point at zero is stable. Okay, this is what I wanted to tell. Uh, thank you for your attention.